Yeah, thank you very much, Ian, for the introduction. And thanks for the invitation to this nice online event. Um, <clears throat> I hope you can see my shared screen. Um, today, I will present you my thoughts or the thoughts I'm involved or the, the work I'm involved about artificial intelligence for architectural and urban design, as the title says. It's done in various institutes, um, partially at the Future Cities Lab, but now also a lot at the AAT in Vienna. And of course, in Weimar, where my main um, focus is at the moment. Um, coming from Weimar, um, I thought it's nice to start with one of the heroes of modernist planning approaches, Walter Gropius, also one of the founders of the Bauhaus, um, who once said that his intention is not to invent a kind of a modern style that we know all know as Bauhaus style or modernist style, but um, to come up with a method to tackle a problem, problem accordingly. Um, based on this idea, what he has done at his time, 100 years ago, um, he came up with a kind of a very basic parametric urban model system that you can see here in the background. So he wanted to solve or optimize the arrangement of buildings to maximize the density and the sunlight every building gets. Um, and this was his system, very rigid, very clear. And of course, they tried to solve problems that they have had at this time, um, 100 years ago, the, the cities were not that bright and streets were small and there was no green in the cities and it was very um, problematic to use the streets and all the things they led to this modern movement and the design of cities as we have it nowadays and if it's regulated. But as we all know, um, there are many problems associated with this kind of city planning with this pure rational solving of problems. And unfortunately, cities are still built like this at many places all around the world, especially where we have fast growing cities in here, example, in Shanghai, or in Ethiopia, Addis Abeba. They follow a very similar approach, but they will run into the same problems that we have here and that we try to avoid now with more this European style of renovating or rebuilding cities, bringing in more green and more open spaces, more parks, especially now with the pandemic, we realize we have to transform some aspects of how spaces are arranged in cities. But back to Gropius. So um, I want to speak about the, the potential of computing, especially the, the potential of artificial intelligence. And that's why I added here on the right side and a different solution for the same problems that I've shown him before. So nowadays, a solution of, from Gropius could be this kind of voxel arrangement that you see on the right side that solves more or less the same problems, but in a completely different way that it's much more complicated to compute. For example, I mean, that's a, an example of this city of Sun God where each voxel has a minimum amount of time sun, direct sunlight per day. And then it looks like this. And um, it's just the result of a relatively complex computing. Um, so the context of what I want to show you in the next 20 minutes, um, that's what I call cognitive computing in design. So it's not meant um, that we will talk about design cognitions or how people um, perceive design. It's really meant to combine the power of computing and the power of human cognition. And that's somehow the idea that I'm working around from different sides and different aspects, how to bring, how, how we can combine these two great systems. Um, as you see in this citation, I don't know from whom it is, but it's, it perfectly um, expresses the idea that computers, they are incredible powerful and humans are incredible brilliant, but I mean, we are slow in solving problems and we cannot, or we are limited. And so the question is how, how can we put these things together in a productive way? 
And before I start with our own research, I just want to give you a brief overview of state-of-the-art tools that are around for computing in design. That's the, the city engine, the tool that allows you to generate cities based on some procedural rules. So you set up some rules what to do when you have certain conditions and then it immediately generates these cities, which is very successful for, for the film industry, but not so much for urban design, urban planning. So I've never really seen a design office using the city engine in a very productive way. Then this example that's, uh, that I found quite nice, that's a relatively new company, this high arc, and they propagate, of course, in the US, but here they have this kind of typical um, houses, but it's completely parametrized and the kind of a, um, for me, a kind of an idealistic BIM model because you can just um, change the parameters, change the needs and change the price that you want to pay for the house and then you get a result. And that's somehow something that I always imagine a BIM system should be able to do. If I have a digital model, uh, it should be able to respond to different needs of the customer or of the person who want to build the house. Um, I mean, they advertise it that they can sell you your dream house without the need of an architect. But that's one of the somehow the, the outlooks to what may happen um, with the profession of architecture. They will be attacked from various sides and that's for sure one side. Um, another direction is this company. I mean, there are a few around, but Space Maker is probably the biggest ones. And they come up with these parametric tools that they develop either for developers of these huge housing projects, for example, or but also for bigger um, architectural companies that they offer you this software system that's a web-based system, which is relatively new. I think they published this this year. So I took this video from them and they combined really a lot of um, state-of-the-art tools that we have now in urban planning. So they can put together here this um, analysis that you see and they have these variants they generate on the fly and then you can select them and show them and compare them and all this stuff that's done now. Um, but this shows, for me, this shows really how far the technology is, what you could do. Um, but it opens also the question that I want to address in the following, um, how we really can apply these great tools. So if you see this, it's, it's super nice, but um, the, the, the question is still, how, how can we bring this into practice? At least from my experience, that's not that trivial as it seems to be. Okay, now I will continue with um, parts of my research, what, what I, what we've done in the past. Um, that's a very old or relatively old example of floor plan synthesis. Um, I often show this to express this basic idea of bringing together the, the concept of um, computing power. Um, if you remember this cognitive computing idea with some kind of interface that allows the designer to control the system. So here, I mean, it's relatively straightforward. You can change the sizes of the space of the rooms and then you get this geometric solution. And always if you change it, you get an adapted solution and you can interact with the geometry as well. If we forward it a bit, then you see you can move around the, the buildings with your mouse and you can change these links and then it rearranges everything. So it's, it's quite responsive and you can explore the design space together with this tool that always shows you how to solve your current problem. But it's up to you to decide um, the search direction and how it shall work in the end. Another example, the, this deep planner. That's something we developed in the last, last two years together with a company called Deep Plan, um, where the aim is that you um, somehow select a new site and then the developer want to know immediately what they can build on this site. So um, we got the, the site information um, from Google Maps or from Catasta data and uh, from, from OpenStreetMap. And then usually you get the surrounding buildings and you can also um, 
get the, the building regulations and all the things we can put in the system. And then it generates you building variants that um, are linked to this, the allowed FAR and the distances and everything is considered. And then you have a first rough estimation, how much square meter, how many square meter you can build on this plot. So that's a very useful tool for quickly evaluating possibilities that you have on the site. Another example where we try to explain um, potential customers or the AIT, that's an organization, a research organization that tries to bring this research into practice. So we try to offer these kind of tools as services. And here, this was um, someone in, in who wanted to know how they can link these tools with their working process that usually starts with, starts with sketching, sketching urban planning ideas that you see here underlying to this parametric model of the street network. And then we try to explain how it works that you can come up with this parametrically controlled model, which allows you to come up with this system that generates you the, the urban design based on sketches that you can also make in this digital way where you can sketch usage distributions, for example, where you want to have office spaces or residential buildings. And then finally, you get the 3D model based on the height and the density that you allow, um, which in this case looks also quite rigid. But if we go forward to this example, this was developed here now at the Future Cities Lab together with a huge research group there and also an urban planning team. Um, somehow a step forward where they defined very detailed rules for the buildings and um, what they shall be able to achieve. Um, but you can change the, the, the somehow the, the basic route or the, the the, the restrictions, the, the border conditions. So you can increase the height, maybe the density, and you immediately get the measures and the 3D models. And you can, of course, also run all these simulations on it um, and get an immediate response. So that's just another example. They're, they are always very similar. I just show you different examples because it's relatively fast to apply them to different projects. And um, you can control the geometry and the usage distribution, which is usually the first step that's needed in an urban planning development process. The decision makers, they want to know how much they have of what and what happens if they change their um, distribution patterns. Another part of um, our um, application of computing and artificial intelligence, I mean, this is a very simple uh, application of artificial intelligence path finding, so to say, to compute the shortest path and um, based on a heuristic. But if you do this systematically in an urban grid, then you get these centrality patterns um, where you can estimate um, where you will have maybe more traffic or higher centrality, which is important for certain usages like commercial usages. You can link this information to the plots or the blocks and based on this information, you can then run certain simulations that allows you to test different assumptions. And I don't want to go into the detail here. Um, it's all relatively abstract, but it allows you to come up with planning scenarios and planning concepts and to test them based on what you know or what you can assume. And that's always linked with these parametric models that can grow something. And then we have these simulations that can test what you have grown based on, I mean, usually in urban design, urban planning, you don't have that much data because you plan in a new situation. And when it's new, you don't have usage pattern and all the things that would be nice, but you can make estimations as good as possible. And that's the way how we try to come up with these proposals that you can refine step by step until you arrive, for example, here at these building patterns that may have different densities. Another application scenario for this um, centrality measures that's here is the city of Jela in Sicily, um, where we made a project with the um, administration there. They wanted to, to link these two parts of the city. That's an old refinery still working raffinery that's somehow to try to um, refurbish it. Um, 
and here they try to um, figure out what they could do with their limited resources in terms of changing their transport system. So what happens if they implement the bus line or extend the bus line? Um, so in these isochrome maps that you've seen here, here you can stop the video. You can see, for example, how the travel distances will change. So in this red curve, there's so and so many minutes that you need to travel. If you add a transport line, then you can reach more spaces from a certain location. Um, so this allows you to check how many people you can reach, how many people um, have some advantage of a new bus line, tram line, or even bicycle stations that we discussed. So that's really a tool to, to estimate which um, action, in this case transport network change, may have on, on your urban system. That's an example that we've done in the last year at the AIT. That's um, a system that we developed to predict the outcomes of simulations. In this case, it's a solar radiation simulation. And we implemented a machine learning model that predicts the outcome of the simulation. So it's nothing new that will, gener will be generated. It's just to have these results faster. That's the main idea behind it. And here, these are wind flow models. Um, and for all these patches, um, they, they were used to train the model. And then also the wind flow was predicted. Um, now we are able to predict the wind flow. And here you can see the, um, so how the, that's the input on the left-hand side, this grayscale map, the height map, and the simulated, or the simulation for this scenario and the predicted version um, coming from this trained model, which is quite good, at least for the regions where we trained it. But in general, it worked quite well. And there is now a website that my colleagues um, set up there called Infrared. If you're interested, there will be a service where you can use these kind of evaluations together with others, where you can quickly evaluate designs as a web service. Then, um, an aspect that I'm, or I find more and more important, that's the design space exploration. So what you've seen in before, um, we can generate many design variants. We have a lot of tools to analyze the designs, either with traditional simulations or with new machine learning methods where you can do it even faster. So there are a lot of things that we can do. And um, so, I mean, that's not really design space exploration, but that's one thing how we can bring these um, aspects together, the generative systems and the simulations or the analysis tools, the multi-criteria optimization. Um, unfortunately, for urban design, at least from, from my research, it's very tricky to apply it on a level that's really practically usable. You can always optimize certain aspects and that's fine and nice. and also in an academic context, really good. Um, but for a practical use, it's um, really tricky because usually you have two of these aspects or two criteria that you can handle with these algorithms. And if you have three or four, then it's called many criteria optimization, which becomes technically very tricky and the results it's very hard to follow the logic of the results and what drives the result to which area of the solution space. So what, for, for me, what's very promising is to use more or a bit simpler um, design space exploration tools. In this case, that's a simple parametric model that we put into a kind of a self-organizing map. And then we vary the parameters of this model with a certain step size. And then we um, have a, some, if you have five um, design parameters, then you have a five dimensional solution or search space or this kind of space that you see here, which is then mapped to a two dimensional space with the self organizing map where you have similar solutions beside each other. Um, that's one step to show and to understand uh, a space of possibilities for an urban designer. 
another one is this um, design space exploration method with these parallel diagrams that you, you have these measured properties for a design and then you can filter them somehow and you can view them and explore them and discuss them with your stakeholder group, um, which is a kind of a state of the art method at the moment that you've also seen in this space maker system in the beginning. It's now commercially available. Um, what we are trying to do, and um, that's shown in this example, to bring this somehow to, to, an, to a next level, at least on, on an academic um, level, where we combine different, or we want to make understandable different um, steps or the consequences of different steps during this decision-making process. So if you make, or if you have this two-dimensional space, this self-organizing map that you've seen before, you just different solutions. And you make some decisions that you want to choose certain variants here and to proceed with them for the next level in your design process, then you will end up, let me just forward here, end up in a new space for example, here you see these are the selected um, variants from stage one, and then you proceed, and then you are limited in the search space of your problem in the next level. This can be put together in various levels, step by step. And um, so finally, um, uh, what we do is to we have um, built up the city intelligence lab in, in Vienna now at the AIT, which is very similar to the value lab at the future cities lab, where we aim to bring together all these technological possibilities with screens, with interactive um, tablets and tables and augmented reality, virtual reality, only with the aim to figure out how we can communicate and discuss all the information that we've produced for a design process. And that's somehow something that's extremely difficult to communicate all this information that we can use for an urban design process in a way that makes it accessible for a group of stakeholders. Let me skip this. That's um, just a nice example that we don't do this only here in our first world um, context. We also do this in Ethiopia here on the countryside. You see my three colleagues um, trying to explain the people there at the countryside somewhere in nowhere in Ethiopia, how their small village will be transformed in the next years um, when it will be grown by, I don't know, thousands of people. And here that's now a video editing, but that's how we imagine it should work that you can really use these tools as a communicative tool to discuss possible futures. Um, I'm coming to the end. If you're interested in more about what I've presented, there is this decoding spaces toolbox that we set up where you can download most of the tools that I've shown. There are also examples how you can use them. There is the city intelligence lab website where you can find examples how we apply it. And there is the online teaching or now online learning platform that we run in Weimar where you can um, use the course or can take the courses that we offer there to learn how to use these tools on online courses that we do there. And of course, um, as always in the movies, I have not done this alone. And there are many people involved that helped me um, here are the names and um, thanks to them and thanks to you for your attention.